if you could stand with me, uh, and we're going to read through a little bit of a uh, passage here in Romans chapter 10. We're going to be in Romans chapter 10, verse 14 to 21. These are the words of God. How then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him of whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. But they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed what he has heard from us? So faith comes from hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. But I ask, have they not heard? Indeed they have. For their voice has gone out to all the earth and their words to the ends of the world. But I ask, did not Israel, or did Israel not understand? For Moses says, uh, I will make you jealous of those who are not a nation. With a foolish nation, I will make you angry. Then Isaiah is so bold as to say, I have been found by those who did not seek me. I have shown myself to those who did not ask for me. But of Israel, he says, all day long, I have held out my hands to a disobedient and contrary people. Let's pray. Father God, we are grateful today that we can, as a, a full family of God, uh, be in your presence and in your worship service. And I'm so thankful for all these little ones and their parents. And we know, God, that uh, it's a, a difficult world to raise a child in and always has been a difficult world to raise a child in. But I pray for strength and wisdom over these parents and blessings on them. I pray that their little ones, uh, whether they're young babies or um, in high school or where, wherever they're at, that they would uh, seek to follow Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior and that the parents here would lead them in that direction as well. And I pray for lots of blessings over them that you would guide and guard uh, over them in their lives. Thank you for this church and this body of believers. We ask that we would be on your mission for your glory and that the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts today would be pleasing to you. And we pray it in Jesus' name, amen. You may have a seat. One of the uh, highlights of my Christian walk was when I was in college, I was part of a, a, a parachurch ministry on campus. It was a great experience, made a lot of great friendships, uh, and it was a, a parachurch ministry that was dedicated to evangelism and discipleship, and it's kind of been the themes of my life since that time. I've wanted to be a part of God's work in evangelism and discipleship. There was a book that I read uh, in college called The Master Plan of Evangelism. I believe it's by a last name author, Col uh, Robert Coleman was the name of the author. And I liked this particular book because it was short, number one. Can I hear an amen? Who likes short books? I like brochures, actually, but I'll, I'll do short books every now and then as well. Uh, but I like plans, so it had the word plan in the title. I love to plan. If you've heard me before, you know I like Excel spreadsheets and just making plans and probably like to over control things sometimes, but I like plans. I really like evangelism. And oh, by the way, if I get a little fired up today, it's because we're going to talk a, a little bit about evangelism. And of course, I love the master and his plan for evangelism. So how could you go wrong with a short book on those three things, the master's plan of evangelism? And Paul today in this passage is going to give us his master's plan of evangelism. Paul has made an extensive argument up to this point that all people can be saved by Jesus. It's not just the Jewish people. It's not just the Israelites. It's anyone and everyone from every tribe, from every tongue, from every nation. They can be saved by Jesus Christ. Uh, there is no limit because of who you are or where you were born or who your family is. Jesus came to save people, uh, again, from every tribe, tongue, and nation. And Paul, when he's talking to his Jewish brothers and sisters, he sees that there's this inherent selfishness in the life of those who know God and his law, but they're seemingly unwilling to spread the good news. And I say that because every now and then I see some reflections of uh, who Paul is speaking to, and maybe the current today church, that there's a, a little bit of uh, unwillingness to spread the good news. And what is it about us that makes us reticent 
to tell people, to proclaim to people the good news of Jesus Christ. Here's a few that I would suggest. Maybe busyness. Um, I'm busy. I'm a busy person. Yesterday, I was in Fort Collins coaching a football game, and then I went to a college football game uh, in Golden, Colorado, at the Colorado School of Mines, Go, go Diggers, um, to watch my son. Um, he's almost in, getting in the game. He's just a redshirt freshman, so give him some time. But I was gone from sunup to almost sundown, and then I went to a homecoming thing for one of my children, to one of my kids, I guess my young, youngest, he, he's a young man now, but taking pictures and hobnobbing and trying not to look like an idiot in front of his date's parents. Um, but that, that was the end of the day. And when I got home, I was exhausted. And that's a typical day in, in the life of the Carlson house. And I know that there's a lot of busyness in our lives. Uh, some of us are reticent to spread the good news because of vengeance. We actually have a, a sick enough heart, we're, we're broken in our hearts enough that sometimes we look at people who are enemies and say, you deserve what you're going to get um, if you don't turn to Christ, and I don't want to tell you about Jesus Christ because um, I'm upset with you, I'm angry with you, you're my enemy. Here's a, a big one, limited knowledge. I know a lot of people who don't spread the good news because they don't feel like They've gone to seminary, they don't have a theological background, they don't know enough about the Bible, and so they have a, a reticence to spread the good news. There's uh, also a disregard of the commandment to fulfill the Great Commission. Uh, Jesus said right before he ascended that we are to go to all the world and preach the gospel, so there's that word preach, the gospel, and we're to establish disciples and baptize them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit because all authority has been given to Jesus Christ and that is the Great Commission. That's what we're commanded to do. Not just pastors, not just full-time missionaries or those, uh, but all of us. We have a, a command to help fulfill the Great Commission. And maybe lastly, we're reticent to spread the good news because there's the feeling of it doesn't matter what we do, God's going to take care of it. I know a lot of folks that maybe fall into that ca category. But Paul clearly says in this passage that we are involved. We all have a part to play. Even the youngsters among us right now um, have a part to play in spreading the good news to your friends and to your communities and to people at your school and people in your business places and we all have this part to play. And this is the reason why God wants to include us and give us this part to play in the spreading of the good news. And number one, God's grace is sufficient to allow us to be involved. He doesn't expect you to be a perfect uh, a Christian to be a person involved in spreading the good news of Christ. His grace is sufficient for you, and His grace is sufficient for you also to give you the words and the wisdom and the strength to be involved, but it does seem complicated, and this is the question, is it really complicated? Is God's plan of evangelism, is it complicated? And Paul, I would say, would say no to that question. It's hard, but not complicated. Um, it's hard in the sense that not many of us, in our experience of spreading the gospel, have had those experiences where it's been really easy and the person's received Christ and it, it's just kind of been this wonderful experience. Sometimes it can be a difficult experience. There is uh, antithesis or there's a, a, an antithetical nature to the gospel in the hearts of men that causes them to fight against it. But those who have been given grace of being saved have a major role to play in the spreading of the gospel. Now, do we really want the world to know. If you were to just think for a moment, do you really want the world to know about Jesus and you were being honest with yourself, what would your answer to that question be? And is that particular priority a high priority on, the, on your list of priorities as a follower of Christ? Is it high on the list that you want to be a person who wants the world to know about Jesus Christ. 
That leads us to our first teaching today in verses 14 and 15 of this passage. This would be the teaching. Preach the good news because it is beautiful. Preach the good news because it is beautiful. Now Paul starts this particular passage with a few questions. And these are rhetorical questions, meaning the answers seem obvious, but it is not obvious to the crowd that Paul is writing to because, number one, they were Jewish. And Jewish people of this particular time frame in history were convinced that everyone outside of Judaism was a Gentile dog. That's what they called you. So if you were not born Jewish, if you were not part of the Israelite nation, you were a Gentile dog. And they would never stoop to the level of telling a Gentile that they would be saved if they trusted in Christ alone for salvation. They believed that the Messiah was exclusively for them. And even some of the folks today in this time period that were followers of Christ, they believed in the Messiah. They still believed that the Messiah was just for the Jewish people. Now Paul is going to tell them something that is revolutionary. And it is true as well, excuse me, <clears throat> excuse me, it's not just revolutionary, it's true. There's a lot of revolutionary talk, but is it true? Uh, Paul is telling people that they need Jesus alone for salvation, and when you do that, it is a revolutionary act. Be not mistaken about it. If you're going to say that the only way to be saved, to be whole, to be made right with God is through Jesus alone, you are committing an act of revolution. And it's a revolution against the natural heart of man. They're in rebellion to God. They're in rebellion to Christ. They're in rebellion to the things of Jesus. And many times in today's act, people want to be, uh, or in today's times, people want to be revolutionaries. And so they add and subtract things to the gospel. But Paul says many times, not just here, but over and over again, he says, if you tell people that they need Jesus alone for salvation, that is the revolutionary act. So there's three th or excuse me, four things, uh, four questions, if you will, that Paul asks to start this out. Uh, first question, how will they call on him? How will a person who is dead in their sin, call on Christ to save them? Secondly, how will they believe in him? How will someone who is, again, in rebellion to Christ, how will they believe? What happens in a person's life to cause them to actually believe that Jesus alone is necessary for their salvation? And then he asks, how will they hear about him? That's apparently important that they need to hear about Jesus Christ. And fourth, how will they preach about him? Now, let me go through these uh, one at a time and answer them uh, according to what Paul is trying to get at in terms of his rhetorical obvious answers to these questions. Number one, call on him. How does someone who, according to the first part of Romans that we've read and we've studied, how does someone who is in rebellion to God, and that, by the way, is all of us with, uh, prior to Jesus saving us, we're in rebellion, we've made our choice, we've chosen to rebel, we've chosen to you know, commit acts of treason against God, it's called sin, okay? So we've all sinned, fallen short of the glory of God. How does that person call on Jesus to save them? Now, call on him is an interesting phrase. This is the literal meaning of it, it means to appeal to a higher court and to ask for help. Jesus, when he talks about people who are more apt to call on him, he talks a lot about children, right? He says the children are the ones that have uh, not an innocence in terms of sin, but an innocence in terms of they understand who they are. They understand that they're sinful and they need Jesus, and at young ages, they're more apt, it seems, to love Christ and to follow Christ and to trust in Christ because they're willing to ask for help. Now, I know my own life. I am not willing to ask for help, especially when it comes to fixing anything in my house. Like, I'm going to figure it out. 
I'll have people say, hey, man, can I help you with that? No, I'm going to figure it out on my own. I know how to get onto YouTube, and I know how to watch the video that's going to allow me to do this particular project in the right way. Invariably, many times it doesn't work out the way I want, but as adults, we have a difficulty asking for help, all the more so in terms of our spiritual need for a Savior. We are prideful. We are rebellious. And so how does a person call on Christ who is in that situation? Here, believe in him. What does that mean? Believe in him means to have a confidence and a trust that he will do what he says he will do. Uh, How will they hear about him? Well, they're going to call on him. They're going to believe in him. And they need to do these things. And they need to hear about Jesus, according to this passage, to do so. Now, I used to think that every single person has to hear like a, a, you know, a gospel presentation to come to Christ. And then I started hearing stories of different places in the world where there was never a missionary, but these people came and they were going to be missionaries to a particular tribe, but they'd already found out that these people were actually followers of Christ. How does that happen? Well, Jesus can do a lot of things, right? He's God, so he can speak to them. He can preach to them without our missionary activity. So people can be saved. Jesus can preach himself to anybody at any time. However, a lot of the time, the uh, people need to hear about Jesus to be saved by Jesus. And this is kind of the bottom line. Lots of people don't know about Christ And lots of people need to hear about Jesus. I want to spend a bit of time this morning right here. And I want you, as maybe it's become normal, hopefully it is normal at New City Church, I want want you to self-evaluate your heart and see if you fall into this category. And I know that I can fall into this category from time to time. Are you cynical about people in terms of their understanding or their desire to understand and believe the gospel? Are you cynical and you believe that everyone has heard and and maybe they've had an opportunity but they've rejected it and now they're going to get what they deserve? That is not the case. There are many in our culture, in our city, in our neighborhoods who seem to us to be anti-Jesus, but they have never heard a clear presentation of the gospel. There's maybe 100 to 120 people in this building right now who know Jesus as Lord and Savior, who could at least explain the basics of You were created in the image of God. You have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Jesus died on the cross so your sins would be forgiven. And he is restoring all things back to himself, including the hearts of men who will be glorified and made completely perfect and new when he comes to take his people to heaven and to be with him forever in glory. You know that. I know that. We know those four simple things. And we could explain those to people And imagine if in this room, 100 to 100 of us that are here in this building went from this place today and each one of us proclaimed, spoke, announced the gospel to one other person. I would, I don't, I shouldn't say bet because that's maybe not the Christian thing. I would almost bet, okay, so it's kind of Christian, that 90% of the people that we spoke to would not have a clear understanding of the gospel. We are not a Christian nation. We did not get born and on our back of our birth certificate was the four spiritual laws of how to be saved. There are many people in your sphere of influence, in your friendships, in your community that have no clue what the gospel is. They don't understand the good news. And they have never heard a clear presentation of the gospel. 
Now, some, some people might say, well, how do you know that? Well, I have conversations with people, and it seems to be the case. But how do you know the opposite? Do we take for granted that because people are born into the United States of America, and there is the proverbial church on every corner throughout our nation, that somehow they have heard a clear presentation of the gospel, and if they're not Christians sitting in a church on Sunday and a part of a local body of believers, it's because they've heard the presentation, they've rejected Christ, they've made their decision, and they're just anti-Jesus, anti-Christian, and, and kind of hateful or spiteful toward, toward anything of Christ. Have you assumed that? And if you think that's true, my second question would be, have you been evangelizing the people that you're around lately? Ooh. Uh, I just got into some of Paul's business. Have you been doing that? Have you been clearly sitting down with someone and saying, hey, I love you, I know you, we have a relationship, and I want you to know four things. Number one, God made you in his image. You've sinned. Jesus died for you. He wants to restore you back to himself. And that is the only way. And apart from that is death, despair, destruction, and misery, possibly for eternity unless you turn to Christ. If you have not been in evangelism or evangelizing your people lately, then you don't know what they don't know. You have no understanding of uh, th their understanding of Christ and the gospel. And I'm shocked many do not know the gospel clearly and are waiting to hear even if they seem anti-Jesus or anti-Christian. So what do we do? This is awesome. What do we do? Here we go. Bring the gospel to them because it is beautiful. The Greeks were these uh, smart, really smart guys. Um, I think Andy might have some Greek in him because he's really uh, really smart guys and they talked about these three things truth, beauty, and goodness that those were kind of the ideals of the human experience we were to seek truth we were to uh, develop beauty and we were to have a sense of goodness about us and it's interesting because the gospel is kind of about those same things and beautiful in the context of what Paul is speaking about here means this, timely. In other words, the gospel is timely. It's here at the right time. When is the right time? I don't know about you, but time kind of, time keeps on ticking, ticking, ticking into the future. Okay? It kind of keeps going by just rolls by. You get used to it. You know, I, I say I'm 50 years old. It seems sometimes like I'm 60 or maybe. It's just like day after day of the same thing over and over and over again. And we take for granted that we've been saved by Christ and we're just kind of coasting in to, to home plate to have our experience in heaven with Jesus forever we started our slide. As soon as we turned third base, we're just sliding into home really slowly and with no uh, ambition and no boldness and, and no understanding that the gospel is beautiful because it is timely. This is the right time. Like your life, whether it be 70, 80, 90 years old, it's timely for you to be evangelizing your world, the world, with the gospel. So the, the question might come to mind, when is the right time? This is powerful here. Ready? Here we go. The right time is since Jesus ascended into heaven, it is timely, it is beautiful to preach the gospel to everyone we know. We can be obsessed with it. We can wake up every morning, and yes, we've got the task list. 
I need to do my exercise. I need to eat my yogurt and granola. I need to have my quiet time. I need to get ready for work. I need to put in my eight, nine, ten hours a day. I need to come home and have dinner with the kids. But overarching all of that, we can understand that the most timely, beautiful thing on our calendar, in our priority list, is the spreading of the gospel. And it's because Jesus ascended into heaven. Since that time, there is nothing more important to the human race than the proclamation of the good news of Jesus Christ. That is the right time. And those without Christ are longing for a message that makes sense of this world and of their life. The gospel is beautiful. It is timely. So preach it. That's the word used. Preach. What I'm doing now, you could call it preaching, but according to Paul in the text of this passage, we are all called to preach the gospel because it is beautiful. It is timely. We're to proclaim it, announce it, tell it. Why? Because we have the answer. Every single solitary problem in the world is addressed through the gospel. The most core difficult problem being that is the, uh, being that if you do not know Jesus, you are dead in your sin and you will spend eternity separated from him forever. In addition to that, the gospel, the words of Jesus are sufficient for everything. Like you can make inroads with a person telling them, and I'll talk about this here in verse 16 and 17, the words of Christ. So, what should we do? We should be confident. We should be bold. We should be joyful. And we should be expectant. The harvest is plentiful. The workers are few. Jesus sent people into the harvest field so that we can see churches grow, people evangelized, lives saved from all sorts of death, despair, and destruction. The gospel is beautiful. Be confident, be bold, be joyful, and be expectant that as we proclaim it, Jesus will reap his harvest. So, that's just two verses, but believe me, we're going to go short. Because this next section just is a, a heavy hitter in one or two areas. What do we preach? Verse 16 and 17. What do we preach? You want to know the short answer? The word of Christ. What do we preach? The word of Christ. What do we preach? The word of Christ. We don't preach our intuitive well-crafted feelings, theories, and sublimations. I don't even know if that's a word. I don't know. Okay. We don't preach our stuff. We preach the word of Christ. In counseling and in other areas of life, when people come to me, and they want to hear something truthful about how they can change or grow or be made different. And I point them to the word of Christ. Invariably, most of the time I get this. Well, don't you have anything else? Like, that, that's really good, I guess. But don't you have anything else? Like, isn't there a short brochure <laughs> that can tell me the best human opinions about how this particular problem in my life can be And i got to say, as I've gotten older, more and more I've said and feel and know, no, all you got is the Word of Christ. That's what we have. So what should we preach? The Word of Christ, because people need to hear the words of Christ, because faith, belief, trust, comes from hearing it. We have added so many things on our calendar as a church that are directly related to the Word of Christ. 
because as an elder team, we came together and we decided we are too stupid to do this on ourselves, by ourselves. We need the word of Christ. It is sufficient for every single thing that you're going through, that your neighbors are going through, and that the world or that sin and all of its consequences have. You can deal with it through the word of Christ, and your faith, your belief will come and get better and grow bigger as a result of hearing it. God's word does things in the hearts of people. If you want healing, wholeness, if you want faith, hear the words of Christ. Confidence in Christ comes from the words of Christ because those words are promises and truths that can be trusted with 100% certainty. And in the world of evangelism, you read like five to ten verses in the book of Romans to people, they'll understand the gospel. And I guarantee you, it'll be slicker than anything that you can come up with on your own. I guarantee it. Last teaching of this passage, verses 18 through 21. There still are no excuses even though we are called to preach the good news everyone who has ever lived has heard the good news he talks about this in uh verse uh let's see where we're at 17 their voice i'm sorry 18 yeah there we go their voice has gone out to all the earth and their words to the end of the world who is there well it's a quotation from Psalm 19, and it's speaking of created things. Okay, so the creation speaks to the good news of God. The conscience speaks to the good news of God. So even though we're called to go talk to people and proclaim the gospel and, and proclaim to them the words of Christ, they still have creation and conscience, so they don't have any excuse. And even if they hear it, or they see it in creation, or they know it in their conscience, many will still reject Christ. And this is what's sad. Even those who know the most of him will reject him. There's been two, and this is probably two of many, but two recent so-called Christian rock stars. I'm not talking about music, but like this weird thing that Christians have about worshiping a particular Christian because of their ministry or a book they wrote or a, you know, a sermon they preached or a church that they've grown, blah, blah, blah. There's these Christians. Two of them have what Scripture calls apostatized. They've turned from the gospel. They've turned from the good news, and they said, I don't believe it anymore. Jesus uh, may or may not be a real person or may or may not uh, be the seer. I, I don't know, but they've rejected Christ. They've spent years in ministry, years studying the Word, years writing, uh, years trying to get people to, to follow them. And they know the most of Christ and they have rejected Him. But as many have rejected Him, many more will be saved. And this is what's critical. Jesus is going to save people that we believe should not be saved. And I think he likes to do that just to get our attention and stop us upside the head and say, I'm in charge of this deal. Now, Paul is saying, I think with sadness to his fellow Israelites, to his fellow Jewish people, uh, Jewish brothers and sisters, you don't get it. You've rejected Christ. <clears throat> you need to preach the good news to those you, you may have despised. God is sovereign over all, and when we feel entitled, we are prideful, and God will reject our pride. And Paul says, even in their rejection, God still pursues a disobedient and contrary people. It says in verse 21, all day long, I have held out my hands, plural. The picture that I, I see is I've held out my hands. 
I mean, if you think of a child, we have our children in here today, and you think of a child that has rejected your instruction. They may have told you that they hate you. They don't love you anymore. They, they're being disobedient. I don't know any parent worth their salt that isn't holding out their hands saying, come back to me. Let's, let's restore this relationship it doesn't matter what you do. I want to hug you. I want to hold you. I want you to be restored back into relationship with me. And even in our disobedience and our contrariness, bad, bad way to say that, it is never too late until it's too late. I thought I was going to die yesterday. I had heat exhaustion or something. It was horrible. I've never felt that before. I was out in the sun too much, didn't drink enough water, yada, yada. I literally thought I was going to die. Um, I guess I was being melodramatic. But it reminded me that the end is near. Even if I you know, live to be like my Uncle Earl, 105, 106 years old, or today might be the day. If you don't know Jesus Christ, it's never too late until it's too late. And your disobedience and your rebellion, in, in the midst of it, God is holding out His hands, saying, if you will receive Me, if you will believe, if you will trust, if you will admit and repent and believe that Jesus alone saves, He'll save you. And you can come to this communion table and you can remember the body broken and the blood that was shed for the forgiveness of sins because God mysteriously saved those uh, saves those that he wills and he holds out his hands to sinners and rebels now if he did that for you and you're a follower of Christ you get the joyful uh, privileged responsibility to preach the gospel. It's nothing more than proclaiming, telling, announcing, I've been saved and you can too. You can be saved by Jesus. And for those of you who are followers of Christ, when you remember this table, maybe God will put on your mind and on your heart some folks that you need to tell about Jesus. You need to announce who he is to them. 100 to 120 people here could see 100 to 120 people out there exposed to Jesus Christ. Think of the power of that. Let's pray. Father God, we're grateful for uh, the good news, it is beautiful. It's timely. Since Jesus has ascended into heaven, it's always been the message that's right on time for everybody. So Father, convict us of our sin as we come to the table today. Pray for your strength to repent of it, to turn from it, and to believe that the gospel and the gospel alone, Jesus alone, saves us. We pray for those outside of these walls who don't know you. I pray that we would have an opportunity and we would take the opportunity. We'd be bold. We'd be expectant. We'd be joyful. We'd be confident that this message, the message of Jesus Christ, is the only one people need. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.